I get to go with me to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. We're going to look at Jonah chapter 2 this morning. We're going to be looking at lessons on repentance from a disciplined prophet. If you remember, last week we learned about, or we took a look at lessons on the will of God from a disobedient prophet. And we're going to move right along into chapter 2 today and learn a little bit about repentance from a disciplined prophet. Have you ever run across something that was not what it seemed to be? Two nights ago, I was parked in the Hobby Lobby parking lot on Surreal's Road. I was finishing up the face sheet of a report that I had just taken when a call came over the radio that a man wearing a white T-shirt and white painter's pants and an Angels baseball hat had just gone into the Walgreens about a mile and a half away had reached over the counter. Actually, it came across as a robbery first, and then it was clarified that he had reached across the counter and taken a $100 bill out of the cash register. He then ran out of the store. He jumped into the back of a black four-door with a license plate of 602CEN, and he took off in the opposite direction of where I was. Well, being the curious cop that I am, I thought, you know what? I'm going to head that direction and see if I can find this guy. So I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, it'd be great if you'd let me find this car. I would love to do that. So as I'm pulling out of the parking lot, again, a mile and a half north of where he was going south, there goes this little black two-door past me with a license plate of 608CEM. And I thought, well, the number's off and the last letter's off, but you know, possibly it could be. So I call out on the radio and I say, I've got this car in front of me. How sure are they of the license plate number? And the dispatch comes back and says, well, they're pretty close, but not quite sure. And so I tell her, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop this car. So I put on my lights and the car just keeps going. And finally, it turns right on 2nd Street, Surreal's and 2nd. So I've got the car stopped. I approach the car very cautiously, and sure enough, there is a guy in the passenger seat wearing a white T-shirt, white painter's pants, and an Angels baseball hat. So I move around there, I open the door, take him out of the car, handcuff him, place him under arrest for taking $100 out of the Walgreens cash register. Five minutes later, I get a call from the original officer who's taking the call. And he says, Mark, there seems to have been a big mistake. Things aren't always as they seem. The guy that you just arrested for stealing $100 never reached across the counter into the register. In fact, he was trying to pay for something with $100 and got shortchanged by the clerk by $30. But there was someone else in the back of the store that couldn't hear what was going on, but saw this confrontation taking place. And she thought that when he gave the $100, that he took the $100. And when he saw the argument between the clerk and the man, she thought he was getting rough with the clerk when he was really trying to get his $30 back. And when she saw him storm out of the store, she assumed he was running. So anyway, unhandcuffed the man, apologized, unarrested him, and made sure that he got his $30 back. It would been a great snag if it had been a robbery. Great. I mean, all the officers were there. Credibility would have, My credibility would have gone way up here. But, you know, things are not always what they seem to be, are they? And that's probably no more the case when you get to chapter 1 and 2 of the book of Jonah. Jonah, who has been outrightly disobedient to the Lord and refusing to go to Nineveh and actually trying to run away from God's presence, has now found himself in quite a predicament. God, not being one that you can just run away from, hurls a great wind upon the Mediterranean Sea, which causes a great storm to arise. So that the ship that Jonah is on is about to break up. This is found in Jonah 1, verses 3 and 4. Then Jonah ends up being thrown into the sea by his fellow sailors after they become very much aware of the reason for the storm, which is about to sink them. They realize that God's displeasure is upon Jonah because of his disobedience. And so Jonah is now in the Mediterranean Sea, bobbing up and down, and having come to the conclusion that he's about to drown. Now, you need to put yourself in Jonah's place for just a moment. Realize Jonah didn't have the information that God had. He, didn't, he was not privy to God's plan. So when he was thrown into the Mediterranean, Jonah wasn't bobbing up and down just waiting for the fish to come by and rescue him. He didn't know there was going to be a great fish. He didn't know he was going to be rescued. In fact, it seemed to Jonah 
that he was going to die. He was going to be left in the Mediterranean. Now, it calmed down because once they threw him into the sea, the Bible tells us that the storm subsided. But that ship is now going to take off. And there he is in the Mediterranean Sea, bobbing up and down, probably thinking that I am going to die very shortly when I no longer have the strength to keep myself afloat. Now, that's bad enough. But then all of a sudden you see a fin circling around you. Big fish. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the things I would be terribly scared of, and I was in the Coast Guard, and I was scared of this. I used to think, what if the boat sank, and you're out there bobbing around the water, and a shark came by and wanted to make a meal out of you? Can you think of a, of, of, of how, I mean, of a more terrible or cruel way to die than being eaten? You know, that would be a terrible way to go. Well, here's Jonah. He's bobbing up and down the Mediterranean. Here comes a fish. And Jonah, in his mind, probably is thinking, I'm about to be swallowed. I'm about to be eaten. And then I'm going to be recycled into strange sea waste. I mean, he's looking at what's going on here. And it appears to him that he is about to undergo the wrath of God in the cruelest way possible. But you see, things are not always as they seem to be. He is anticipating God's judgment upon his life. He's anticipating that this whole situation has been designed by God to destroy him. And that the fish that is now about to eat him is going to pulverize him into little bitty pieces. And what he doesn't realize is that God has designed all of this to rescue him from a life pursuing sinful pursuits, namely running away from God. Things are not always what they seem to be. God's ways are not our ways, and that's very much the case when it comes to him bringing us to repentance for our sin and for our sinfulness. So we're going to take the remainder of the morning, and we're going to learn as well to take to heart some lessons on repentance from a disciplined prophet. And What we're going to really see as we move through this passage is we're going to get a new look or at least a a renewed look at at a God who didn't give up on a prophet who did. And I want you to understand as we move through this passage that oftentimes we do give up. We fall into sinful patterns. We fall into things that we shouldn't be doing. We struggle with besetting sins. And oftentimes we give up. And we need to realize that we serve a God who does not give up on his people. God let Jonah go only so far before he jerked the chain and brought him back to himself. And if you're a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will persevere to the end, not because of who you are and what you're able to do, but because according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, our God will cause us to persevere if we truly belong to him. And we're going to see that come through in the book of Jonah. Now, let's review for just a moment. If you remember last week, we spent our time learning about lessons on the will of God from a disobedient prophet. And by way of of just a refresher where we're going here, keep in mind that Jonah was up here somewhere in, in, in Israel, the northern kingdom. God tells Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh is about 500 miles east, northeast of where Jonah was. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. And the reason he didn't want to go to Nineveh is because the Assyrian capital was in Nineveh. He knew from the prophets of Amos and Hosea that this group of people, the Assyrians, in about 50 years were going to come down and conquer Israel because of Israel's disobedience to the Lord. But he also knew that the Assyrians were a treacherous and a cruel people who did terrible things to their captives. And he did not want to be the agent that God used to spare Nineveh so that Nineveh could come down and conquer God's people. Now, Nineveh was a city of somewhere between probably 300 and 500,000 people. If you go over with me to Jonah chapter 4, look at the last verse where God says, Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand as well as many animals? Now, that 120,000 people who don't know the difference between their right and their left hand, that could be interpreted as children. 
You know, my children that are young don't know the difference between their right and their left. When I used to tell them when they were two, three, four years old, okay, look down at your right foot, they wouldn't know what their right foot was. So this could be children. If this is children, you've got 120,000 children in this city. And if you'd say that well, they, they probably have two parents, you're talking almost 600,000 people in the city. Now, other scholars say, no, that's really talking about 120,000 adults who simply don't know the difference between what is right and what is wrong. They don't understand God's ways as opposed to man's ways. Well, even if these are adults, they probably have children. And so you can still double that or triple that number. This is a large city that God desires to bring to repentance. But again, Jonah doesn't want to have any part of it. So Jonah says, I'm going to get away. And by way of review, he says, I'm going to Tarshish. Now, again, remember where Tarshish is. It's not down here near Israel. Tarshish is all the way over here in the southern tip of Spain near the Strait of Gibraltar. That's 2,500 miles. And after you get past this coast of Spain and North Africa, you've got the Atlantic Ocean. Jonah says, I want to go to the end of the world to get away from God's plan for my life. Well, he starts to run from God and God says, you know what? We're going to jerk your chain. We're going to hold you up. I'm going to let you go so far, but you belong to me. And it's interesting that before God brings repentance to the city of Nineveh, he brings his prophet to repentance first. That person that belongs to him, he says, I'm going to persevere you and I'm going to do in your life what is necessary to bring you back to the place that you need to be so that you can grow in your relationship with me. So that's basically the background of what happens. Now, we're at that point where Jonah has gone through the storm. He's been thrown into the sea. And so he's somewhere out here bobbing up and down in the Mediterranean. And God has sent a great fish to swallow Jonah. And it says in chapter one, verse 17, Jonah is in the stomach of the fish for three days and three nights. Now, again, let's just review very quickly the principles we learned last week about the will of God. Number one, God's word is God's will. It says the word of the Lord came to Jonah and said, go to Nineveh. That's God's will. When God's word says it, that's God's will for your life and for my life. Now, Jonah thought that he was going to run from the Lord. And so in Jonah chapter one, verse three, he says, I'm going to Joppa. I'm going to find a ship that's going to Tarshish. A whole bunch of open doors there. Like I explained to you last week, you would have a ship leaving Joppa to go to Tarshish maybe once every six, nine weeks. And for Jonah to show up down there on the day that the ship's going to leave and to have the exact amount of money for the fare and there's room for him to go, that's a lot of open doors. And how do we often try to interpret the will of God for our lives? Open doors. We hear it all the time. I got an open door. It must be God's will. Not if it's going against God's word. Open doors have to be confirmed by the word of God. So if you've got God's word saying you do this and you've got all the open doors saying you do this, you better go with God's word. Open doors don't supersede the word of God. The next principle we learned, you can't run away from God without what? Running into God. You cannot escape God's presence. Number four, pursuing a course in direct opposition to the known will of God will always result in negative and even dangerous consequences for yourself and others. We saw that in Jonah's life. Pursuing a course in direct opposition to the known will of God does not thwart God or his plan in any way, shape or form. We're going to see that as we move to the book of Jonah, that despite what Jonah was going to do, God was not surprised. In fact, when you look at the end of chapter one, verse 17 it says, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah in the Hebrew. It's actually and the Lord had already appointed long before this happened. He had already appointed a great fish to do what this fish was going to do. God was not surprised. He's not looking down at man and saying, you know what? Let's see what he's going to do. Let's see what she's going to do. Oh, no, they're going that way. Let me think. What am I going to do here? OK, OK, we're going to do this. Oh, let's see which way they're going to go now. Oh, they're going that. OK, now we're going to do this. We don't have a God doing that. This is a sovereign God. We're not into open theism where you're waiting to see what's man going to do. And then God reacts to what man's going to do. God is not that kind of a God. We also learn that we must pursue the known will of God for our lives as it's revealed to us in his word. Now, let's look at Jonah chapter two, and we're going to start to learn some lessons on repentance from a disciplined prophet. Number one, God's chastisement is designed to produce repentance and spiritual growth in the lives of his children. 
Keep in mind, we're not dealing at this point with an unsaved man. We're dealing with a man that knows the Lord. We're dealing with a man who is a prophet of God, a very successful prophet of God. We're dealing with God's children right now in terms of chastisement, discipline, and repentance. Now, I think it's very interesting, again, that before God does a work in the city of bringing a city to himself, he has to do a work in his prophet's life first. I think there's a principle there that before we are going to see revival come to the city of Albuquerque, before we see God do a great work in any of the communities that we're in, perhaps even at our own places of employment, in our own families, there's got to be a work done in us of bringing us to himself in repentance. Now, again, God's chastisement is designed to produce repentance and spiritual growth in the lives of his children. When you work through this whole book, you're going to see that Jonah is being chastised by God. He's being disciplined by God. And let's look at verse 17 of chapter 1. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. This is God's hand of discipline upon Jonah's life. God is rescuing him from death, but he is also disciplining him for his disobedience. Now, before we move into chapter 2, I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 12 for just a moment. Why does God not just let us go? Why does God chastise his children? Why does he bring discipline into his children's lives? Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. If God does not bring chastisement into your life for disobedience, if God does not bring discipline in your life for disobedience, then you need to really ask yourself the question, am I really a child of God? Now, I don't know about you, but most of the time I am very fully aware when I am under God's chastisement and under God's discipline for disobedience. Very miserable. There is nothing more miserable than a believer who is walking in disobedience to the Lord. And God lets you know that very quickly and you've got to either repent or you continue in that state of miserableness. Now, let's look at what Hebrews 12, verse 5 says. Have you forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. Notice it's not if you are reproved, it's it's when you are reproved by him. None of us are perfect. None of us live the Christian life as consistently and as perfectly as we ought. We are going to be continually reproved by God through his word and by his spirit. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share in his holiness. Then look at verse 11. All discipline for the moment seems to be not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Don't you think that Jonah is having a pretty sad time? I mean, can you imagine looking into the mouth of a great fish and knowing that, that you are about to become eaten? You're about to become his meal? But now you're not his meal. You're sitting in the belly of this fish and you're wondering what's going to happen? And can you imagine what it's like to sit in the belly of anything? All those acids turn you white and, and all that kind of stuff? It's sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, look at this. Afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Going through discipline is not so peaceful. Enduring God's discipline, enduring God's chastisement will result in the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Let me just share this with you. Any type of lifestyle that is not characterized by righteousness is not peaceful. The only lifestyle that is characterized or can be characterized by peacefulness is going to be that which is righteous. Any other lifestyle is going to be just the opposite. When you look at work and you look at those unbelievers that seem so happy and seem to have life by the tail and everything's going well to them and for them and you think to yourself, well, you know, they just don't seem to be, be having such a bad time. They don't know the Lord, but look how successful they are. I guarantee you their life is not peaceful because without righteousness, they can have 
no peace. That's why God disciplines us, that we might become holy and that we might enjoy the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Go with me to 2 Corinthians for just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 8 through 10. For though I caused you sorrow. Here's Paul talking about this letter that he had written to the Corinthians in regard to the disobedience that they were allowing to continue in their midst. For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it. For I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. Why does God discipline us? Why does he chastise us? Why does he bring these things into our lives? To bring us to a point of repentance. For you are made sorrowful according to the will of God. Well, that blows that whole concept, doesn't it? That God doesn't want us to ever be sorrowful. That God doesn't want negative things to ever occur in our lives. Look again, you were made sorrowful according to the will of God. So don't let anybody tell you when you're sorrowful that this cannot be the will of God for your life. There are times when it is the will of God for your life so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. God's chastisement, God's discipline in our lives is designed to produce repentance and spiritual growth and to produce peace, the peace of righteousness in our lives. Now, let's go back to Jonah. We're also going to see this, and part of this is working up to Jonah chapter 2. God's chastisement was progressive. It was progressive, increasing in severity until Jonah repented. Very good principle for us to keep in mind. God's chastisement is often progressive, increasing in severity until there's genuine repentance. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 4, the Lord hurls a great wind on the sea. There was a great storm on the sea, so the ship was about to break up. Jonah had a chance to repent right then, but he didn't. Then you go to Jonah chapter 1, verse 13. However, the men rode desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. His discipline, his chastisement is increasing in severity. It's progressing from bad to worse. Jonah still doesn't repent. And if you look at verse 15, so they picked up Jonah, they threw him into the sea and the sea stopped its raging. Jonah has a chance now to repent, but he doesn't repent. Finally, God in verse 17, a point, the fish is already appointed. The great fish comes, it swallows Jonah. And so what you see is that the chastisement was progressive. It increased in severity until he finally repented from the belly of the fish. In Jonah chapter 1, 4 through 17, and again, we're laying the groundwork for chapter 2. It's interesting that Jonah's repentance was initiated by who? Who was it initiated by? God. Who jerked the chain? God did. God didn't let him just continue on over to Tarshish and find himself a little cabin and live a life over in Spain having nothing to do with his accountability and responsibility over here in Nineveh. God says, no, no, you're not. I'm jerking this up short. God initiated that repentance. I want you to look down at Jonah chapter 3, verse 8 for just a moment. Here is something the king of Nineveh says, which I find very interesting. I wonder if we could confirm this with the word of God. But listen to what he says. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. This is after Jonah does come into the city and he preaches. The people are, are turning to God and the king makes this decree. He says, both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Now, I want you to see the progression here. He says, let men call on God that each may turn from his wicked way. The word turn there is the most common word in the Hebrew language for the word repent. It simply means to change one mind, change one's mind, to turn back to, to return, to repent. Go with me to 2 Chronicles 7.14. It's this word right here. 2 Chronicles 7.14. We're very familiar with this passage. 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14. You know it. And my people who are called by my name, they humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. That word turn is the word repent. Most common word in the Hebrew language for repent. 
It's the same word that is being used in Jonah chapter 3, verse 8. But I want you again to notice the progression. He says, let each man call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked ways. In other words, asking God to give me a heart of repentance. He's saying, let all of you ask God for repentance. Well, why would you ask God for repentance? Because the Bible teaches that repentance is a gift. I want you to go with me to Psalm 60, verse 1. Psalm 60, verse 1. The same word is used here. Psalm 60, verse 1. Literally, it, it simply means to turn back, to change the mind, to repent. Psalm 60, verse 1. Oh God, you have rejected us. You have broken us. You have been angry. Oh, restore us. Oh, repent us. Oh, turn us back. They're asking for God to turn them back. Now, I think there's a principle here that, that is very helpful, especially for those of us who struggle with besetting sins. Do you struggle with besetting sins? Keep, keep in mind here, we're talking about a believer here. Sometimes you struggle with these sins that just seem to get a hold of your life and you're trying to break these sins and these sin habits. And so you're doing everything you can to, to try to break this thing and you're using willpower and everything. Have you ever asked God for a repentance? Have you ever gone to God and cried out to God and said, God, would you give me repentance in this thing and change my heart so that I desire you more than I desire this? It's interesting, isn't it? Look over at, at Psalm 80. Psalm 80. Psalm 80, verse 3. In this passage, it's repeated the, three times the same verse. O God, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us and we'll be saved. The word restore is the same word. Repent. Turn us back. Notice what they're doing. They're praying. O God, turn us back. If you look over at verse 7. O God of hosts, restore us. There's the word again. Cause your face to shine upon us. We'll be saved. Look at verse 19. O Lord of hosts, restore us. Repent us. Turn us back. Cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. If you look over Psalm 85, look at Psalm 85, verse 4. Restore us, O God of our salvation, and cause your indignation toward us to cease. Repent us. Make us repent. Give us a heart of repentance. If you look over at Lamentations chapter 5, that's right after Jeremiah. Go to Lamentations chapter 5. Lamentations chapter 5. Look at verse 21 through 22. The last two verses of the book of Lamentations. Restore us to you, O Lord. There's that word. Same exact word. Turn us back to you, O Lord, that we may be restored. Now, here's what's interesting here. Return us back to you, O Lord, that we may be returned back to you. Do you understand what he's saying there? Or repent us to you, O Lord, that we may be repentant. But what you've got to see here is this. It, it wasn't in them. They had to ask for this. They had to cry out for this heart of repentance because it didn't come natural to man. If you look over at Acts chapter 5, look at Acts chapter 5. What's it say in the New Testament about this? Acts chapter 5. Look at verses 29 through 31. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one on whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince, a savior, to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Jesus grants repentance. In other words, it's, it's a gift. It's got to be granted. And so that's why the king of Nineveh is saying, you may, We need to call out to God that he'll give us this heart of repentance and turn us back. Turn us to where we need to belong, where we need to go. Look at Acts 11. Look at Acts chapter 11. Acts 11, verses 17 through 18. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gifts as he gave to us also after believing the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they quieted down and they glorified God, saying, Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Where does it come from? It comes from God. It comes from God. Look over at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. Paul telling, giving Timothy some instructions here and in dealing with people that aren't so nice to deal with. 
And verse 23 says, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Repentance comes from God. It comes from God. It is a gift of God. And so we see that Jonah's repentance was initiated by God. God is the one that did the work in bringing him to this place of repentance. God jerked his chain, brought the chastisement, the discipline into his life, and then gave him that heart to repent. Now let's go back to Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2. You know, there's... So I don't know how, if you've ever spent a great deal of time in Jonah. There is so much in Jonah that we could be in Jonah forever. And I want you to understand that what is true for Jonah is also true for the unbeliever as well. God's got to grant that heart of repentance. Because unsaved man is not going to do that unless God begins and initiates that work in his life and brings him to that point of repentance and gives him that gift of repentance. Jonah's repentance. Here's principle number four. Jonah's repentance was, not a proce- was a process, not an immediate act. Now, keep in mind, he's a believer already, but yet his repentance here, as far as repenting to, to running away from God, was a process, not an immediate act. When you go through the book of Jonah, you'll see in chapter 3 that even though he obeyed God, his preaching was really probably not the best of preaching. And when he gets to chapter 4, he's still angry that God saves these people. We don't see Jonah coming to full repentance until the writing of this book. I think that that's important for us to understand that when we deal with sin in our life, that oftentimes it is a process. How many times have you gone to the Lord, you've repented of a sin, you're genuinely sorrowful for this, genuinely desiring to obey God, and for two or three weeks you do just great, and then boom, you do it again and you say, Oh, man. And you, after a while, you just don't come to God anymore, do you? Because you're so ashamed, so embarrassed that you just say, I don't even, I'm not, I, what's, the, what's the use? Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever been there and just said, what is the use? It's a process, guys. It is a process that may take you the rest of your Christian life to break some of those sin habits. It's a process that should be going like this. You're going to have dips and it should be continuing on. You're going to have dips. But the person that belongs to the Lord is going to recover from the dips. They're going to get back up and they're going to say, I'm going back to the Lord. I'm going to confess this again. And, and, I'm, and it's going to progress. It was a process for Jonah, not an immediate act. Robert Owen Roberts writes this in his book, simply entitled Repentance. People do not belong to Christ's family because they make good first-time professions of repentance and faith. What is required of all in the family of God is that they persevere, that they go right on making the same open, bold, ongoing proclamation that Jesus Christ is Lord both in words and in life, firm until the end. It is very common to hear someone describing repentance as a past accomplishment, saying things like this, I repented when I was 18 years old, or you don't need to worry about me, I repented 12 years ago. If someone comes to me with a report about repentance sometime in their past, I want to cry out, so what? Who cares what happened a hundred years ago? It's never enough to say, I repented. You must be able to say, I am repentant. Day in and day out, month after month, year after year, unceasingly, I live as a repentant person. I live in the spirit and the attitude of repentance. In other words, repentance must be and will be continual and persistent if it is real. If it's real. If it's not real, then it's not going to persist. It's not going to be continual. Thus, for the Christian, as it was for Jonah, our repentance begins at salvation, but then continues and grows as we grow in Christ. It begins with an act, that act of coming to Christ when we repent of our sins and our sinfulness, we, we surrender our, li- our lives to the Lord. He becomes our Lord and Savior, but it manifests itself as a process and a way of life if that profession was true. doesn't mean that you're perfect. doesn't mean that you don't have these days. Boom. But it ought to be that when you have those days, you get back up, you go to the Lord, you confess, you repent, and you get back up on track again. 
For Jonah, it was a process, not an immediate act. Number five, Jonah's repentance began from where he was in the belly of a fish, not from where he'd like to have been or hoped to be. Look at verse one of Jonah two. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the stomach of the fish. You know, a lot of reasons people don't repent is because they wait until things get worse or things get better. Don't they? Don't we sometimes? We know we're in sin. We know we're in disobedience to the Lord, but we say, you know what, I'll just I'll wait until things get worse or I'll wait until I got this under control. Then I'll go to the Lord. You know, I'll wait until I can beat this thing and then I'm going to go pray to the Lord. That's the problem with besetting sin. You come back to the Lord and after a while you come back to the Lord and you come back to the Lord and pretty soon you're so ashamed, you're so embarrassed, you say, you know what, I'm not going to come back until I've got this thing whooped. Jonah repented from where he was. Not where he hoped to be. Not where he'd have liked to have been. He repented from the belly of the fish. He was at the very bottom. You, know, you don't get much lower than the bottom of the sea. And you don't get a whole lot lower than in the belly of a fish at the bottom of the sea. Repent from where you are. Don't wait for better circumstances to repent of known sin. Don't allow the awful consequences of your sin to keep you from coming to God in repentance. It is never too bad or never too late to turn from sin if you are still conscious and breathing. Never. Come back to the Lord. Jonah's repentance, first and foremost, revealed itself in utter desperation, dependence, and humility before God. Look at verses 1 and 2 of Jonah 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish, and he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. King James puts it from the pit of hell, something like that. You heard my voice. The word called there in the first part of verse 2 means to cry out to God as one who is inferior and who has no resources of his own to fix the situation or to fix himself. It's the humble cry of one who is desperate for help and realizes that his only hope for deliverance lies in the person he's calling upon for help. The word distress means extreme anguish, turmoil upsetness with what's going on in his life. And so, so Jonah, as he comes to God in repentance, is, in crying out to God in this way, is, is revealing his utter desperation. He's revealing his utter lack of resources to fix this or to fix himself. And so he's crying out to God and saying, you're the only one who can fix this. And you're the only one who can fix me. This is, I cried for help. From the depth of Sheol. And you understand what he's saying here. Sheol is a Hebrew word which is very most commonly used for a grave or the death. Sometimes it's used to refer to the afterlife. Usually, though, it's used of death in the grave. So Jonah is crying out from the end of his rope. I mean, try to imagine what it's like to be in the belly of a fish at the bottom of the sea. He has no, no idea, no reason to believe he's going to be rescued here. I mean, he's thinking he's just going to go die in this thing. And so he's crying out for help. And the word help in Hebrew is one of the Hebrew words that is the most picturesque word for a desperate and despairing cry for deliverance. He is at the end of his rope in utter despair. He is in desperation and he is crying out in dependence and humility to God for help. I think that that's where repentance probably is first revealed in our lives. There is no pride left. No pride. Pride has been crushed. It has been destroyed. And what you see, I think, here is that broken pride is the first mark of genuine repentance. Now, keep in mind, just a little while earlier, this little prophet is in defiance of God. You've all seen the pictures, I'm sure. Oh, you know, the little mouse that's defying the eagle that's about to sweep down on him. You've seen those pictures hanging around. Well, that was Jonah with God. Proud, arrogant, defying God. And now he is on his face, crying in desperation for help. Broken pride, I think, is the first mark of genuine repentance. There is no repentance if you've got pride. No repentance if there's pride. Can't be. 
Number seven, Jonah's repentance acknowledged God's discipline and chastisement in and upon his life. Look at verse three. For you had cast me into the deep. Notice who he gives responsibility here to. For you had cast me into the deep. I thought it was the sailors on the boat that cast him into the ocean, into the Mediterranean Sea. See, he realizes who's behind this. He acknowledges who is disciplining him, who is chastising him. And so his repentance acknowledged God's discipline and chastisement in and upon his life. You are the one doing this. The truly repentant have no doubt who it is they have offended and who it is that is dealing with them and why. They know who they've offended and they know why this is occurring in their lives. Number eight, Jonah's repentance realized and acknowledged the severity of his sin before God. Look at the second part of verse four. So I said, I have been expelled, or actually the first part, I have been expelled from your sight. See, here is acknowledging the severity of the sin. The word expelled that's used here in the New American Standard comes from the Hebrew verb that means to cast out, to drive away, to banish from one's presence. It was the word that was used in Genesis 3.24 of Adam and Eve being driven from the garden. It's used in Job 30, verse 5, of banishing outcasts from society. And in Leviticus chapter 21, verse 7, it's used of a man divorcing his wife. The idea is separation. And so Jonah is acknowledging that the severity of his sin before God has produced a separation between him and God. He is fully aware of what his sin has done. And he is acknowledging that to God. He's confessing that to God. I have broken fellowship with you. I'm the one that has gone my own way. I'm the one that has turned away from your face. I'm the one that is running. I have broken the fellowship. He acknowledges the severity of his sin. You know, all sin separates us from God. All sin does. And in the believer's life, the separation is a break of fellowship. And while we often tend to diminish the separation because of 1 John 1, 9, you know, we have a tendency in our Christian lives to diminish our sin and diminish the results of that sin, which is a breaking of fellowship with God because we say, well, if, we're, uh, you know, if we'll confess our sins, God is just and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. So let's just go sin because we've got 1 John 1, 9. Good thing we've got 1 John 1, 9, right? What if there was no 1 John 1, 9? But see, our problem is this. Because of 1 John 1, 9, I'm glad 1 John 1, 9 is there. We tend to diminish our sin. And we tend to diminish the separation that it produces between us and God. And we've got to understand that the separation that all sin produces between us and God, even though it is experiential and even though it's going to be temporary because we are true believers, if we are, still robs us of joy that we could have. Go with me to Psalm 1611. We looked at this just briefly last week. Psalm 16, verse 11. You will make known to me the path of life in your presence or looking into your face. That's what Dan was talking about, about the dog looking into your eyes. The idea in Hebrew is looking into God's eyes, looking into his face. In your presence is fullness of joy. So if you are not in his presence because of sin, what don't you have? No joy. No peace. A miserable existence. Good thing there's 1 John 1, 9, but we should not diminish the fact that all sin robs us of joy because it takes us out of the experiential, immediate presence of Christ. We're not looking into his face anymore. We have turned our back on him. He hasn't turned his back on us. We've turned our back on him. Look at Jonah chapter 2, the second part of verse 4 through 6. Nevertheless, I will look again towards your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Here's the principle, number nine. Jonah's repentance led him from despair to hope. Do you see this progression that he's going through? Humble, desperate cry to God for help. 
I'm in the worst possible situation I could be. I have been expelled from his sight. I have separated myself from God. And yet he's coming back to God. And as he comes back to God, this repentance is leading him from despair to hope. He says, nevertheless, I will look again towards your holy temple. The end of verse six, you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. A repentance, and hear me very carefully here, a repentance that continues to keep us entangled in the guilt and despair of our sin is not true repentance. That's pride. Say, so how can it be pride? Because you are not willing to accept the forgiveness that has been offered to you. Because somehow you're not so desperate that you don't think that you still can't attain to this somehow. You're not so desperate that you don't think that somehow I can do better. True repentance releases you from guilt and from the burden of your sin. Because you cast it all upon the Lord. You receive the forgiveness that he offers and you go on. A false repentance will continue to keep you entangled in the guilt and despair of your sin. Because you are coming to God and you're, you're going through the motions, but in the back of your mind, you're thinking, I can still do this. I can still make myself better rather than coming to the Lord and saying, I am a heap of trash before you. I need your help because I can't do anything because there's nothing good in me in this flesh other than what you produce. A false repentance will leave us entangled in the guilt and despair of our sin. True repentance brings our sin and our sinfulness before God and it leaves it there for him to forgive and to take it up again and place the awful burden back upon our shoulders is an act of unbelief in the fact that Christ has forgiven us and restored us. You know, when you, when you are walking around with this false guilt, with this guilt that you continue to heap upon yourself and you, you're not willing to lay it before the Lord, you're not willing to deal with it, you're a miserable Christian because you're out of fellowship, because you're not believing Christ. You're not believing that he's forgiven you. You're not willing to lay this at his feet. And you continue to think that I've got to deal with this. I, you know, I've got to work myself up to this, this forgiveness. You know, we are to walk the Christian life the same way that we started it. We bring it all to Christ and we say, here, I, it, you're the one has got to pay for this. You're the one has got to deal with it. I can't. No way. Number 10, look at verse 7. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Jonah's repentance was not to a position or a place of ministry or service, but to God himself. How many people do we hear? And I, I hear people all the time. And in fact, I fall in this trap myself. You know, I'm going to repent so I can be used by God. I can repent so that, so that God can do a mighty work through me and other people's lives. I'm going to repent so that I can be used to change other people who are going through the same problem. That's not repentance, people. That is not repentance. Repentance is not to a position or to a place of ministry, but to God himself. The key word is remembered. I remembered the Lord. The Hebrew word for remembered refers to the deliberate act of, of placing God before you in your mind and your affections. It's the deliberate process of meditating and thinking about God. Now, keep in mind, what did Jonah do? He ran away from God and said, Tarshish, I'm going to Tarshish. His repentance said, I'm turning around. You, God, are the one I'm going to think about. You're the one that's going to be before my eyes. You're the one that I'm going to meditate upon. You're the one I'm going to dwell upon. You're the one that I'm interested in serving. His repentance was to God himself. I don't think that Jonah, at this point in, in his life, at this stage in the belly of the fish, ever thought he was going back to Nineveh. I don't think Nineveh was really in his mind right now. But he did want to be restored to God. He did want to repent and be brought back to a place where he was before the Lord. Before Nineveh could turn back, before Jonah could turn back to Nineveh ministry, he had to turn back to God. And you know that process is not vice versa. We don't turn back to ministry and then turn back to God. We've got to be turned back to God. Number eleven, and the last point. Jonah's repentance revealed and reaffirmed God's desire to deliver his children from their sin 
their sinful selves and ultimately the consequences of their sin. Jonah's repentance revealed and reaffirmed God's desire to deliver his children from their sin, their sinful selves, and ultimately the consequences of their sin. Look at verse 8. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. The NIV is probably the best rendering of this verse out of the Hebrew. And here's what the NIV says. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. If you don't have NIV, write that down. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Jonah is reaffirming and revealing God's desire to deliver his children from worthless living. Those who cling to worthless idols, the, the, the word literally in Hebrew is vanities, empty pursuits that exclude God, including a non-repentant life. And so what the verse is saying is if you're going to cling to your sin, if you're going to cling to your sin and not repent, then you are going to forfeit the grace that could be yours. God's desire is to forgive. God's desire is to bring you to repentance. God's desire is to restore. But if you're going to persist in holding on to a non-repentant lifestyle, Jonah is saying, then, then you are forfeiting the grace that could be yours. Because you're the one that is going to persist in this lifestyle that is empty. Look, verse 9, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. He reaffirms the source of his salvation or his deliverance as being the Lord himself. Rather than being the source of condemnation to his children, he is the source of their salvation. Go with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Look at Romans 8 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus? Do you know Him as your Lord and your Savior? There is no condemnation for you. There is no anger. There is no wrath. It was paid for by the Lord Jesus at the cross of Calvary. Don't. Don't. Say that he's angry with you or that his wrath is going to come upon you. It's been paid for. It's been taken care of. Look at verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he called. And these whom he called, he justified. And these whom he justified, he glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. He's saying, Christ isn't going to condemn you. He died for you. He paid the price for your sins. Look at verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will running from the will of God and trying to go to Tarshish? No. Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is the message of the book of Jonah. A God who does not give up on a prophet who did. And if you don't take anything else out of here today, please take out of here that God is not going to quit or give up on you even when you do. He brings you to repentance if you are truly his child and he does the work that he is going to do in you. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Well, I'm not lying to you. I just think of other verses as we move along. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. I love the way Paul ends this letter. He says in verse 23 of 1 Thessalonians 5, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. 
And may your spirit and your soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what a wonderful prayer, isn't it? And don't you hope it's going to be true? Well, look at the next verse. Faithful is he who calls you and he also will bring it to pass. You mean it's going to happen? It's going to happen. Because of me? No, not because of you. Because of him? Yeah. You see, if you're a true believer in Lord Jesus Christ, you will persevere to the end because he will preserve you to the end. Now go with me to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3. Look at verse 12. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Well, how would you know if you had an unbelieving heart? Look at the next phrase. That falls away from the living God. You see, if you don't persevere to the end, you are never His. Those that are His will persevere to the end. Ups and downs, battles, but you know what? They're convicted of their sin, they're sorry for their sin, and they come back in dependence and humility, they confess their sin, they repent, and they've got to realize it's a process. Verse 13, but encourage one another. Day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ. Now look at this. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Those that know Christ will persevere to the end. Verse 10 of Jonah 2 affirms and reaffirms that God sometimes immediately but always ultimately delivers his people from the consequences of their sins. You know, you and I might sin and God will forgive us and restore us, but he may not immediately restore us from the consequences of those sins. You have an abortion, that baby's not going to come back alive. You have an illegitimate child, that child's always going to be, be there. You wouldn't want the child to go anywhere. You steal something, you're, you're always going to be Christ seen as a thief. I mean, the consequences aren't removed immediately, but you know that ultimately one day they will be. Ultimately, one day he delivers us even from the consequences. You know, Abraham Lincoln was once asked how he was going to treat the rebellious Southerners when they had finally been defeated and returned to the Union of the United States. Fully expecting President Lincoln to exact vengeance upon his enemies of several years, he was very surprised to hear the president say, I will treat them as if they had never been away. You know, that's exactly how God treated Jonah after he repented and came back. You don't see in Jonah 3 and in Jonah 4, God bringing this issue up again. What you see him say is, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to Nineveh. God treated him as though he had never been away. Isn't that great? You know, no matter what else is going on in your life, you and I can be thankful of that, can't we? He treats us as though we had never been away. How does God treat you and I after we've repented of our sin the same way? You know, one more thing. Before God worked to bring Nineveh to repentance and salvation... He first brought his prophet to a renewed state of repentance. And perhaps that's what we need to really be praying for when we think about trying to evangelize our neighbor and our coworker and our cities. God, am I repentant? Bring me to a renewed state of repentance before you. Then use me in the lives of other people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and I thank you for the book of Jonah. What a wonderful book that teaches us so much about how you deal with us in our disobedience and even in our obedience. Father, we pray that you'll take what we've learned today and apply it to our hearts and cause us to be a people of great rejoicing because we know that if we are truly yours, you will persevere us to the end and you will discipline us and you will chastise us and you will produce in our lives holiness and the peace of righteousness. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.